Okay, Dr. Lim, I think it's, um, we can go ahead and start the intro. Okay, good morning. That sounds great. Good morning, everybody. Um, Laurent, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. So everyone, good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laurent Vlog to us today. He is the Chief of Obstetric Anesthesia in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. He's published extensively in the area of obstetric anesthesia with peer-reviewed articles, editorials, abstracts, reviews, books, chapters, and commentaries. He has also won numerous awards, including Best Education and Research Awards through SOAP and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And he has presented routinely at, re at regional, national, and international meetings, including visiting professorships, such as today's. His scholarly activities are focused on clinical obstetric anesthesia practice and education, as well as enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery. Good morning, Dr. Wallach. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. This is my first cross-country uh, Zoom meeting. So if I speak too quickly, too slow, if something's wrong with the slides, please let me know immediately. I hope I try. I can. I hope I can fix it. Um, my disclosures, as Grace mentioned, I um, was co-chair of the Enhanced Recovery of the Caesarean Committee of SOAP. And I'm sorry to interrupt. We cannot see your slides. You cannot see my slides. I can see okay. your beautiful face. <laughs> okay, that's not enough. You were sharing and then it um, stopped a couple minutes ago. Okay, let's see more actions. Um, let me see. I was sharing. Okay, let's start again. That's perfect. Okay. So, um, okay. So you see the you see the title slide? Yes. All it's right. Perfect. So my good. Now you have the disclosure slides. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I'm uh, I work as a consultant for private anesthesia groups, and I have done consultancy for Pajunk Medical Systems. Um, and this is right now how Seattle looks right now. It is four in the morning, and when I agreed to help this presentation. I, I was not aware of the time difference, but now I am. So um, let's start. Okay. So you probably wonder why I've been invited to give this presentation. And it is because of my work with SOAP's Enhanced Recovery of the Caesarean Committee. The board asked the committee to create specific ERAS guidelines and recommendation for caesarean deliveries. I had the distinct pleasure to co-lead this team of uh, national experts, inclu including your very own Dr. Grace Lim. In these guidelines, we recommend pathway elements, uh, C-section ERAS or EREC should include. We called it EREC because ERAS is actually a protected title. The recommendations are based on the best available scientific evidence or expert opinion. Okay. This graphic summarizes the various pathways recommendations. And you recognize the typical anatomy these ERAS pathways have with the usual pre, intra, and post-operative recommendations. Of course, in anesthesia, we have a long since tried to standardize care during and where possible after the surgeries, especially the pain management. It's kind of new for us anesthesiologists to focus on the pre-operative period. The fact that we can improve uh, patient and baby recovery and outcomes preparing them better for what is to come, preparing them mentally, preparing them metabolically, organization, etc., cetera, was a completely new concept. Uh, more than 20 years ago, Henry Kelly, who was a pioneer in perioperative pathophysiology and rehabilitation, initiated the first enhanced 
recovery protocol for colorectal surgery. And he called this concept pre-rehabilitation. And obstetric can now finally be added to the long list of surgical specialties who have embraced this concept. Let's look a little bit at the anatomy of these typical elements. Um, we usually, most ERAS pathways present with days, what to do on day one to six and then post-op day. Very important is the day of surgery. There they present different, uh, address different um, fields like pain management, diet, fluid management, mobility, medications, and so on. In order to generate such a complex pathways, yes, um, to optimize these multiple aspects of patient care, yeah. and we try to decrease patient stress, it takes, it takes a whole village to organize this. And this is actually not a village, this is actually a town, and this is Zurich, Switzerland, and this is where I was born, worked and lived before I came to the United States. These processes involve multiple teams, and you see it also includes the patient, and it is also sort of like a new paradigm in enhanced recovery to, to empower the patient to be part of their own recovery rather than to be a passive consumer of healthcare services. Okay, it's a multidisciplinary approach and it takes multiple meetings and multiple cycles to create the pathways. Meanwhile, the UW, the University of Washington, has over 23 enhanced recovery pathways. And it doesn't go a month by where we don't have an additional pathway um, coming up on our intranet. Okay. These pathways really allow to optimize patient management in various sites. So on all our four hospital sites, these pathways are now the guidelines and every provider is expected to follow along the guidelines. I'm gonna dive now a little bit into some specific points mentioned in the pathways. And I have been asked by Dr. Lim to focus on a couple of topics so I will not talk about every single point, but I will focus on a, on a couple of highlights, okay? And I'm starting with an element that caused some discussion among the committee, it's hemoglobin optimization. And I know what you're thinking now. It is clearly not the domain of obstetric anesthesia to optimize patients' hemoglobin, but the fact is that antepartum anemia predicts postpartum anemia, and postpartum anemia is linked to depression and fatigue. So it matters for enhanced recovery. And because we are part of that village, the committee felt anesthesia providers should at least be aware of this fact. Okay. At the University of Washington, there is no specific protocol. And when I figured this out, that there's no specific protocol, I started nervously texting around to everybody I knew and I asked, do you have a hemoglobin optimization protocol? And a little bit relieved, I realized we're not the only one. And it appears to be that not many places have a standardized hemoglobin optimization protocol. But that leaves, of course, room for improvement. And that may be one of the next uh, obstacles, we're hurdles we're going to try to take here at the UW to improve our patients' outcomes. Another important fact, and anesthesia providers are well aware of this, is preoperative anxiety is associated with reduced maternal satisfaction and it yields to poorer recovery. Anxiety affects the sympathetic tone and increases the hypotension of the spinal anesthesia. Anxiety is the worst before the surgery and it lasts until skin closure. So it is in the spirit of an enhanced recovery protocol to really 
tackle this anxiety and, and deal with it as good as possible. And in order to minimize the surgical stress response, we have started multiple uh, education initiatives to improve our patients' knowledge, to empower them to understand what's going to happen to them, to teach them. And we're going to do it when we've done that through multiple, multiple avenues. We've given them guidelines about MPO, about the importance of early ambulation, how to take the pain medications. We give them specific discharge instructions. For example, on the homepage of SOAP, you can find various handouts which you can use for your own institution and distribute it to your patients. And a lot of information is provided. It's very hands-on, it's very practical. And uh, we have done our own version of this at the University of Washington and patients are really appreciating it. We've also created on SOAP's homepage a patient a patient facing poster, which um, shows the next steps of their recovery. What does the mom has to do? What does the baby have to do? Who, which visits are expected and so on. And this is also a poster which was on SOAP's homepage and we did our own version. So empowering the patient and providing information is a great tool to remove or to reduce preoperative anxiety. Of course, living in Seattle with all our technology, we have created an app. It's called the UW Baby App. And all this information, which I've shown you now, is also available as a PowerPoint on this app or on our homepage. And it addresses the major questions patients has, have, and it's being handed out and patients have access already weeks before their cesarean delivery and can reach out to their providers if they have questions. Of course, another important part is, and, and that is how basically everybody recognizes during the day of surgery, oh, there is an enhanced recovery protocol going on, is we're trying to limit the fasting interval. We're trying to provide carbohydrate, we give apple juice, and we know that surgery represents a major stressor and that disrupts hemostasis and leads to a loss of body cell mass. So perioperative nutritional support mitigates this surgically induced metabolic response and it promotes the optimal patient recovery after the surgery. And I have to say that our nurses immediately picked up on that. They already knew long, long before we were aware of that, that this perioperative fastening was a real stress for the patients. Intraoperative, and I'm leaving this one and I'm going right to the next topic, and intraoperative nausea and vomiting is another major stressor for mother and for baby. And it is a multifactorial phenomenon. It is in order to minimize intraoperative nausea and vomiting, we try to prevent spinal hypotension and we use, we use that with vasopressure infusion. We provide prophylactic antiemetics, Zofran and dexamethasone, even though dexamethasone, because of its pharmacokinetic, only really works for postoperative nausea and vomiting. And then we want to optimize our uterotonic administration by um, giving the oxytocin on a drip. We have two different regimens. We have one regimen which is for scheduled cesarean deliveries and one regimen which is for intrapartum cesarean deliveries. And the intrapartum cesarean delivery regimen starts with a slightly higher bolus of unit and then a continuous infusion compared to the scheduled regimen. One major factor is, and we've keep kept observing that, is that when the uterus is being exteriorized, women were doing sig significantly worse during their C-section compared to women where the uterus was, was repaired inside to. 
And we've been going back and forth with our surgical colleagues, how we could tackle this issue. And we started with a basic understanding of the anatomy. And when we have a perfect T4 spinal anesthesia level, we still have the vagal nerve, which innervates the whole um, gast gastrointestinal tract. And then a version and an extroversion of the uterus causes traction. And this traction causes intraoperative pain and nausea and vomiting. This is nothing new. And I looked a little bit in the literature and I found that in 1990, already an obstetric anesthesiologist suggested that attempts to persuade obstetrician not to exteriorize the uterus have been met with varying degrees of success. However, this would probably be the most effective prophylactic measure. And this was addressing pain perceived during a perfect spinal anesthesia. So the problem is not new. What does the literature say? A meta-analysis meta performed in 2015, okay, compared exteriorization of the uterus with in situ repair. And it was a systematic review of the current available literature. It included 14 obstetrical studies and two anesthesiological studies. And the findings were, were that exterioration reduces yields less blood loss, although clinically not significant, a smaller drop, an insignificant drop in hemoglobin, and there was no statistical difference in the need for blood transfusion and um, blood loss anyway is not a very objective outcome and it's very difficult to assess. Inside to repair, on the other hand, may be associated with less occurrence of endometriitis and the faster return of bowel function. You can see that this meta-analysis did not address our main question. Does it, does in situ repair improve IONV and PONV? Because they weren't, um, they weren't the primary outcomes. So it's a little bit useless for our purpose. So I did my own review of the current literature and there is um, especially one more trial here, a randomized controlled trial. And I looked, I focused on studies where IONV and PONV was the primary rather than the secondary outcome. These three studies I found, one only includes 80 patients but the other one includes over a thousand patients and it was a randomized controlled trial. All studies find a reduction in intraoperative nausea and vomiting and in postoperative nausea and vomiting. And they also find, the larger study also finds that there is less incidence for uterine atony if the uterus is repaired in situ. Okay. And while I feel that one swallow does not a summer make, I feel there is a signal, a small signal hidden in this data and a meta-analysis is needed really to shed light into this issue. And I'm aware of the meta-analysis, which is currently under review, but I was not, I wasn't given the results. But there seems to be, there seems to be an indication that insight to repair is advantageous for the mother and for the whole stress and for the incidence of nausea and vomiting. So if I had to summarize the current situation as follows, okay, there seems to be a growing body of evidence suggesting that inside to repair, okay, is feasible and has more advantages for patients. There is less IONV, less risk for adeny, less risk for intra and post cesarean pain, less risk for post-operative gastroparesis, and in situ repair does not increase blood loss, infection risk, and in trained hand does not prolong surgery. Another finding is that saline irrigation is also increasing intraoperative nausea and vomiting um, compared to avoidance of saline. 
So now we have this data and then we have the reality. And, and of course, reality change is hard. So how are we tackling this at the UW? So we used the creation of the enhanced recovery protocol to sit down with our surgical colleagues and, and have a powwow. And we talked about it and, and we said that just a perfect cesarean section can turn into mayhem because of the exteriorization of the uterus. We presented them with the data. We showed that there is not really a disadvantage for repairing the uterus in situ. So change is difficult. We have a great relationship with our obstetrician and they really, really care about their patients and they want to try to do it as good as possible. We made and inside to repair an element of our enhanced recovery protocol. And it's now sort of like an official guidelines almost for three years. We remind all the teams at our preoperative checklist and our surgical colleagues attempt an inside to repair first and exteriorize only if there are problems. An increasing number is now repairing the uterus in situ. So that's a great, great development. And they actually told me that they feel that in situ repair improves their surgical skills. And it is helpful in specific situations. For example, when the uterus can't be exteriorized in the morbidly obese, or if there is an extensive history of the terminal surgeries. So talking, giving these enhanced recovery presentations in the last few years, a lot of anesthesia colleagues share their concern that they have a, that their obstetricians are not uh, repairing the uterus in situ. And it took almost four years at my own institution to sort of like change this paradigm and, and, and open up this, this possibility to leave, to leave um, the uterus in situ for repair. And I know this is difficult, but it's something we can achieve as a team because ultimately we all want the best for our patients. Another big problem is when the patient has intraoperative nausea and vomiting is we are, we are, we are impairing skin to skin contact with mother and baby. And that is the second big point I wanna address in this presentation. We promote skin to skin contact and we try this in various ways. For example, we try, we're not putting the EKG cables which we place after the spinal anesthesia is placed, usually once the patient is repositioned, we place them on the back of the patient, okay? We create ample space for nurses and pediatricians to access the baby and the mom, and we actively help to warm the baby, and we're part of really the care team. And this picture is a picture from the UW Medical Center, and this is a picture how an ideal C-section should look. And of course, if the mom has now this increased peritoneal traction and has nausea and vomiting, that would completely disrupt this rhythm. There is an ample, ample amount of literature suggesting the benefits. Those are maternal benefits. If the mom has early skin to skin, the placenta is easier expulsed. There's less postpartum bleeding. Maternal stress is reduced. Um, it uh, reduces postpartum depression at six months, a recent study showed. It increases more social, interactive, maternal caring, parenting, bonding behavior, probably drive by increased oxytocin release. So there's multiple, multiple benefits studies over the last 30, 40 years up to very now. There is multiple benefits for the baby. It decreases the fetal stress and it improves baby thermoregulation. It reduces crying. It increases breastfeeding initiation, suckling. It increases breastfeeding rate at discharge. It increases breastfeeding self-efficacy, improves latching, and it improves fetal blood glucose level. And we just recently looked at this data as well, and we can confirm that it's not published yet. So what constitutes skin-to-skin -skin care? So UNICEF, 
So it constitutes if the mom and the baby are uninterrupted in contact for more than one hour after the delivery, the golden hour. So UNICEF did a study and found that worldwide only about 45% of baby experience early skin-to-skin -skin care. In the US, the CDC found that about 83% of hospitals practice early skin-to-skin -skin care. However, in the CDC questionnaire, the question was relatively open because they asked how many patients experience mother-infant skin-to-skin contact for at least 30 minutes within two hours of uncomplicated cesarean births. So it's not quite the level and quality of skin-to-skin -skin care we're looking for. A recent Cochrane review showed that in reality, only about 70, excuse me, 47% of the eligible tries reported really an early or immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact. And the reported duration is uh, ranges from about 15 minutes to up to about a day. So there's a big, big range. So what does the American Academy of Pediatrics state? They say, require that a healthy infant should be placed and remain in direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mothers immediately after the delivery until the first feeding is accomplished. Okay. The alert and healthy newborn infant is capable of latching onto a breast without specific assistance within the first hour of birth. Okay. The baby should be dried while on mother, assigned UPGAR scores while on mother, and all initial physical assessments are performed while the infant is in contact with the mother. Okay. This also, the advisory also suggests to delay the bath, needle sticks, weighing, measuring, eye medication until the feeding is completed. Okay. So the baby shouldn't leave the mother until its first feed. It shouldn't be washed and the assessment should be done while um, on mother. Okay, amniotic fluid and vernix are protective layers, okay? And they are, um, so routines of early bathing removes that protective layer. Also, the first skin tag of the baby should be with the mother's skin and be colonized by the mother's skin flora and not by the handling stuff. Okay, this is here at the UW as well. And we see that a newborn assessment is done on mom. It's always very busy at the head of the table. And it really is important that the mom and baby are stable. Of course, if the mom now starts to have IONV because of increased peritoneal traction, which you see, we can't really do much about it because even with the best spinal anesthesia in the world, the vagal nerve is not blocked. It completely disrupts this harmonic picture. So it's, it's, it's all connected with each other. Okay, one, would should, one should delay the first pass after the first feeding. The WHO recommends putting off the first pass up to 24 hours, okay, in favor of skin-to-skin -skin care. We dry the baby, but we leave all the creamy layers of vernix on the baby and we place the dried, dried baby on mother's skin, okay? We also don't put a diaper on because this causes just another disruption. So, so we have now all this data and, and how, how did we implement it at the UW? We actually just revised the guideline and the basic idea is we aim to maximize skin-to-skin -skin mother and infant contact in the first hour of the delivery. Of course, there's strict contraindications, prematurity, birth defects, fetal distress, maternal inability, or for example, if the mom has a GA, which is kind of rare, but it does happen. Okay, and I'm very, very sorry for this slide but it is fresh off the press because we're virtually implementing a new way to do that and, and to optimize skin-to-skin -skin care. So we, what we do is we, we make sure that everybody in the room is okay with it, obstetric, anesthesia, pediatrics, and nursing. 
And then during the delayed core clamping, we confirm one more time that the mom is stable and able to provide this immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact, okay? There's reasons when we don't do that, either because the baby has respiratory issues, there's cyanosis persists, or the tone is poor, but usually we try to do it right away. The baby is then carried by the pediatricians back to our domain and placed unwrapped onto the mother's chest, okay? And then we provide the warm blanket and the head, okay? Mom's arms are free. We allow arms, moms must hug the baby. We have a blood pressure cuff and an IV, but we call, but we, we, we make sure that there's a lot of slack that the mom can comfortably hold the baby. And we also have to make sure that the surgical clamp of the umbilical cord is not in the way, but usually that's not a problem. And then the pediatrician stay for five minutes in our quarters and perform the first assessment and give then a sign out to the baby's nurse, which will continue to stay with us basically for the rest of the for the rest of the cesarean delivery. That was a bit of a complicated issue because that nurse is also a helper of another nurse in the room and anesthesia needs to be a little bit flexible here and help with the care of the baby. We polled our team and everybody's happy to do so. And then skin and skin, skin to skin contact will be maintained as much as feasible with minimal interruptions, basically until the first feed or bath or as long mom and baby want. Sometimes there, of course, are reasons to interrupt because the mom is not feeling well. Also, when we move the mom from the operation um, table to the stretcher, there's a short period where the mom goes, where the baby goes back to, to the warmer. It's maybe one or two minutes. We interrupt, but not longer. Okay. Um, so, so the IONV and PONV prophylaxis and um, maternal and fetal skin-to-skin -skin mother infant contact sort of like play together hand in hand because if the mom's not feeling well, the skin on the skin-to-skin -skin is not going well, then all these benefits which I have showed to you in the previous slide with all these studies um, so the baby can't benefit from that. So, so we are really, really trying to, to optimize and to provide skin to skin to every mother who wants that and every baby who needs that. I'm going to quickly jump now to another little uh, goal intraoperative from our surgical, from our ERAS protocol. And that is hypothermia. We try to avoid maternal and fetal hypothermia. And um, we're using an underbody warming mat and it's this device. And what we do is this device starts to warm up as soon as there's pressure on it. We warm it to 36 degrees. We add additional um, warm blankets on top of the mom and another bunch of warm blankets shortly before the baby comes. So she's really warm and toasty and the baby won't uh, experience hypothermia and the mom as well. We know that hypothermia is associated with wound infection, shivering, some cardiac morbidity, the bleeding is worse. And so this was a, this was a little bit of an achievement because on the body, uh, warming systems were not really used at the UW Medical Center unless you were in for a cardiac a surgery or a liver transplant. But we were able to demonstrate that we had a reduction in wound infections and actually the reduction in, in care costs allowed us to buy two of those systems. So I'm sort of proud of this because, because we always try to optimize workflows, you know, with um, the well-being of the patient. And then here, actually, it sort of made sense. We were able to save money when we were able to spend it for something we really needed. So goes also into the whole complex that mom and baby needs to be warm and comfortable. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about studies, science. Where are we at with this in our field? 
we, of course, at the University of Washington, also did one, did a study, design, many, many other colleagues did, and we did a before and after enhanced recovery study for planned and unplanned cesarean deliveries at the UW. This is our pathway. This is very similar, like many pathways, like the one I've showed you before, and it's sort of like lie and explains very clearly whatever what all the specialties have to do. So we started this pathway and oops, I don't need to jump. Okay. And we saw that for planned C sections, we found that the average length of stay was reduced about 25%. Um, 30 day readmission was better. The readmission rate was not increased, direct costs improved, and post-operative direct cost also improved. So it was a hit. Everybody was very happy with C-sections, we did ERAS protocol, all the numbers look great. We did the same thing for unplanned cesarean deliveries. And you see that even though the unplanned cesarean deliveries, they don't benefit from any of the pre-operative measures I told you about all the explanations, the anxiety measures, the PowerPoints, the apps, they were showing pretty similar results. So that made us wonder, you know, how much is this preoperative counseling worth for these kind of outcomes? And we haven't really found an answer. We also found, of course, an increased, and I'm sorry for the crummy slide, an increased opioid use and patients were overall feeling, patients were overall feeling better. So I was asked to show a little bit about the current literature. And so what have others been focusing on? I mean, there were, as of half a year ago, 11 peer reviewed studies. Two of them were RCTs. Most of them were pre and post impact studies. There's actually two more studies now, which I'm aware of. So there will be um, 13. There were also pre and post impact studies. And what have people been studying? They've been basically looking at hospital lengths of stay, financial savings, maternal satisfaction, readmission rate, opioid use, breastfeeding success up to six weeks postpartum, and maternal and neonatal bonding. So, so far, the literature mostly shows that people have been using existing IT infrastructures and, you know, compared to data before and after they, they initiated an ERAS protocol. When you look at abstracts and letters um, about this topic, which are suggestive of probably the study, the, the publications, which will be hopefully made out of them, that is also the outcomes they're focusing on. Um, so there's still a lot to do in terms of research and enhanced recovery. The um, ERAS and ERAS USA Society started to create sort of like a framework on how to actually report ERAS related studies. And they suggest as a bare minimum that the researcher should in their study describe the ERAS protocol and they should also measure adherence to protocol. And this, most of these studies, I would say almost 90% of these studies, ERAS studies in the literature, they don't do that yet. So, so there is definitely a, a quality improvement needed. I'm showing you this slide again, okay, because I want you just to look at all the care elements the um, SOAP is suggesting should be part of a ERAS protocol. And now I've done a little tally. So this is the um, American um, Heart Association um, Practice Guideline Recommendation Classification System. We have class strengths of recommendation and we have the level of evidence. And I put all these recommendations in this tally. And when you look at the strengths of recommendation, we really only have strong recommendation for 10 care elements, and we really have only a high quality level of evidence for eight. And for all the others, the level of evidence is moderate 
and the strength of the recommendation is moderate and occasionally weak. So here's your research agenda, because essentially, ideally, we want to have all recommendations in our protocols to have at least strong or moderate level uh, recommendations and a good quality of evidence. So what is the future research agenda? What should it look like? So we address now that there's many, many, many evidence gaps and we have to identify which pathway elements are crucial, crucial and which not, which pathway elements are essential and not. We should sh study how we can increase maternal acceptance of interventions because at the moment we're sort of like throwing a lot of information to moms and we don't really know and we don't really know what works and what not. We have to define a consistent set of metrics and we have to define what protocol compliance means and we have to go above and beyond the pain scores. We've done that now and there is more to it. Cost effectiveness has to be determined and of course, and that's why I put a picture here again of Henry Kellett, the specialist of perioperative rehabilitation, we have to better understand the pathophysiological factors affecting maternal recovery and fetal well-being. We're currently at the U um, looking at maternal and fetal glucose levels and uh, preoperative fasting and carbohydrate loading. So it's a small step into that direction. We have to better understand how these ERAS protocols tackle the big elephants in the room like postpartum depression, breastfeeding success, neonatal safety, maternal ability to care for the baby. Okay, we have to better understand how ERA guidelines affect postpartum chronic pain, the partner and family experience, and of course, maternal mortality. And last but not least, I think ERAS protocols allow us to standardize care in a way that we can also provide the same great care, outcomes and experiences to each and everybody of our, in our society. And it's a great opportunity to reduce racial disparities. It's an opportunity which we shouldn't miss. All right, thank you so much for your attention. I can't see you, I only see my computer, but I, I know you're there. <laughs> I'm open for questions. Thank you, Laurent, for an excellent talk this morning um, and for getting up extra early for us in beautiful Seattle. Hopefully there's some sun out by now, but maybe not. Rain. <laughs> um, if I'm open for questions and maybe I'll start one for the group. Um, Laurent, could you maybe give us a quick overview or outline of how the Iraq protocol recommendations that you have outlined are different or the same from the many dozens of um, ERAS for C-section publications that have come out in the last 24 months or so? So one thing we were particularly proud of is that we, for each and every recommendation, present sort of like a level of evidence and uh, quality strengths of recommendation. We are focusing, we're focusing exclusively, you know, on anesthesia, intraoperative care, and we are presenting a lot of information about how to prevent intraoperative hypotension how oxytocin protocols should be applied. Of course, ERAS protocols from, from other, from surgical disciplines, they don't specifically address that so much in detail. We have a, a large portion addressing multimodal analgesia, the value of multimodal analgesia. I didn't go into that topic now because I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Thanks, Laurent. Are there other questions from the group?
I have a question. <laughs> I might have the answer. It's Commissioner Wills. Uh, there is a question from the chat, Laurence. The first one is, um, you see a very medically and psychosocially complex OB population at uh, UW, which has applicability for us here at McGee. What have you had to adjust to accommodate this, the medical and psychosocial complexity piece? So we have, for our ERS protocol, we have a pretty strict inclusion and exclusion criteria because the fast and rapid enhanced recovery, like including mobilization, early removal of IVs and Foley catheters, obviously doesn't work for a population which has large cardiac comorbidities. But as you saw, when we compared unplanned cesarean deliveries with planned cesarean deliveries, even if you apply a fraction of the elements of the pathway to a patient's care, you can already improve their quality. So what we do with complex patients is that we sort of like cherry pick which, which elements of the pathway are appropriate for their pathology and which not. So we modify, we modify our sort of like standard, standard ERAS protocol. Is this answering the question? Uh, yes, I think so, Dr. Gossman. Uh, please feel free to elaborate if there's additional comment there. There's um, another question that says, uh, Laurent, can you please comment on your institutional milestones for postpartum recovery and discharge from the hospital? So, so to achieve discharge criteria is not the same thing like discharge from hospital. And we are not looking really at the, when when the patient leaves goes home we are we're, what we're focusing is on when would the patient be able to go home very often patients stay longer either for fetal or for social or other reasons and one of the milestones is this achievement of this discharge criteria which is sort of was sort of like a, a change in paradigm because we always always looked when is the patient leaving but we are now looking when could the patient be going home not when is the patient going home which sort of like relaxes this whole slightly political issue a little bit thanks Ron. there's another question here um it says what nursing or anesthesiology resources support consistent skin to skin in the operating room and did you have to shuffle around your staff to accomplish that goal so that's that that was one of the things where we basically for a change all agreed we all agreed that early skin to skin is the way to go we've been doing it ever since since we have eras and this new guideline i showed you we're having a very structured approach about it and then actually the biggest shuffling was including the pediatrician into our teams because because OB anesthesiologists and, and labor and delivery nurses, we've been working together, we know each other, we, we are one team, and the pediatricians are also part of this team, but they've always sort of like, you know, appeared as a consulting service and then disappeared, maybe took the baby with them, maybe not. And it's we're starting to sort of like build this collaboration with the pediatricians. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, we, we needed to create a lot more space behind, behind the blood brain barrier and we have an additional chair on wheels which we just can wheel in so the pediatrician can sit with the additional person uh, the mom is bringing into the room so so basically the the partner of the of the woman is sitting the pediatrician is sitting and the nurse and we are standing like this we're creating sort of like two two platforms where one thing is happening and where the other thing is happening. And that works pretty well. Thanks, Laurent. That sounds awesome. Have you found at any point that that has interfered with your ability to monitor um, maternal status in such a dynamic time where lots of stuff can be happening, including extra blood loss, for example? Of course, and 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 because the mom is hugging the baby, the blood the blood pressure cannot be you know easily assessed. So so sometimes, and 
So what we do is we we sample the sample frequency of the blood pressure until the baby's out is about a minute, once a minute. And once the baby's out, we decrease it, if possible, to about once every three minutes. And when the baby and the mom is, when we want to know the blood pressure, but the mom is hugging the baby, we just say, can you quickly stretch your arm out? And we measure the baby. And then the adjacent person helps holding the baby. They usually love to do that. And um, so we work around it. It's it's obviously not as ideal, but I feel the the focus on this part of the of the section is all about baby and mother unit so we 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 work around it perfect um another question here did you have variable success of implementation at your multiple uw ob sites well i don't know if you can see that i have normally black hair but now I'm having white <laughs> hair, and that is because the UW medical system bought two more hospitals, and now we're in charge of the CBC of the Center for Birth Control in a community hospital, and we are, we are, we have to bring everything there now, and it's it's very very complicated, and I think it's going to take three four years. That we are adapting all our protocols, and we the expectation is that everybody, you know, plays along it, and um, it's slowly happening. You know, sometimes a, a senior figure has to be exchanged. That happened as well, and you know, we try to focus. I always my my, my concept is always go for core groups. So so if we into go into this new hospital, I build a core group of three four believers. And and then we we're sort of like spreading out from from that group, and everybody's always welcome. So variable success, yes, but it's improving. Sounds perfect. Uh, other questions from the team. How how are you guys doing it? Are you how is your skin to skin protocol? Is that happening or? Yeah, I was looking to see if we have any nursing. Um, I'm not to cold call anybody. I see Vivian was on here. I don't know if she's still on here. Um, but if any of the nursing team want to speak up, we did invite them to come listen to you this morning, Laurent. Um, we do have a skin to skin protocol in place, it is a little bit dependent upon who is available from the nursing team to help. Um, it is not as involved as what you have um, uh, outlined as far as the pediatricians doing assessments on the on maternal side, but that is, I believe, occurring on vaginal deliveries with a fairly um, routine frequency. And cesarean deliveries, we're still assessing in a warmer but I can immediately see how this could be potentially something that we can support in these stable deliveries. Um, is anyone, I'm trying to see if there's anyone else who wants to unmute and speak to these points. Hi, Grace, it's Vivian. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I mean, skin to skin is something that we support for all patients, um, particularly the badge deliveries that's offered to every patient. You know, our, our ultimate goal is to get pediatrics to assess the baby on mom's uh, abdomen, you know, particularly for vaginal deliveries, but I think it's uh, an interesting concept to do it in the OR as well. And when there is a NAN or an extra nurse available in the OR, we do offer skin to skin for C-sections. So it would be nice to see that more uh, uh, standard for all patients. I can I can highly recommend these commend and recommend these efforts. I have to say that the whole C-section experience has completely changed since we routinely do this. It's 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 so right, you know. The the a lot of our change has been driven by the pediatricians, and I have to say that they really you know, push now this new protocol, I think, uh, based on a couple of new studies coming out and also 
also we just were always open for everything and I never said no and I always created the space and I was a lot in the OR making sure that things go smooth and, and we've sort of established this routine now and I do not regret it. I think it's it's uh, it's 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 a great, great benefit and advantage for baby and mom. It really enhances their recovery. Yeah. So I think we might be coming up on time here. And uh, Dr. Gossman, who's our chief medical officer, is saying in the chat, thank you very much for this talk and for getting up so early to help <laughs> us get through this important topic. And I echo those sentiments. I owe you um, something. Uh, I can't get you coffee because you're in Seattle, but I'll think of something, Laurent. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I am... Next time when I do a talk so early in the morning, I'll get up 10 minutes before and warm up. <laughs> thank you. So, thank Amazing. you. Thank you very much. And have a good rest of your day. Good morning. If you want protocols or paper or information, email me. I'm happy to, to, to send it. Sounds thank perfect. You. Have a great morning. Bye. Bye.